So welcome to people who are joining. We're waiting for um, Nicole to get everybody into the room. We'll give it a couple of minutes. And Nicole, you'll just have to let us know when, when you have everybody in. Everyone's in, but there's still a couple. Uh, we're at 38 right now, or 39. So there's still a couple people just coming in. So maybe we'll wait a, a minute or so. Yep, that's fine. Good. Just let us know when you think it's slow down as people are coming in. Yeah, I think we are good to start. Great, excellent. Um, well, welcome everybody. It's wonderful to see people coming out to our town hall. Uh, we were just talking about, I know we're all kind of Zoom fatigued, but we wanted to make sure we shared with you um, the year in review for Wickery and what we've been doing. And, and, um, and it's hard to do that when we never see each other. So we, Todd and I decided let's do a town hall and, uh, and, and just let everyone know what we've been doing. So um, thank you for being here. My name is Sandy Davidge. I'm the executive director of Wickery and I'm here with Todd Alexander, our associate director. And I'm gonna hand it over to Todd for land acknowledgements. Morning, everybody. Thanks for joining in uh, your busy Zoom days. I am happy to acknowledge that Wickery is part of the University of Alberta. Um, exists physically mostly in Edmonton, which is traditionally known as MS Kowalska Way, Kowalska Hikan, which is a reference to the Beaver Hills House um, in Cree. Um, and that this treaty that we, territory that Edmonton exists on, um, has been a traditional home treaty six to a number of Indigenous communities, including Cree, Saltu. Nakota Sioux, Blackfoot, and Métis peoples. And I think it's not sufficient, or we at Wickery don't think it's sufficient to merely acknowledge the treaty territory upon which we live, but we need to reflect upon what that means. Um, and I implore everybody here to read Treaty 6. I mean, it's a, not a relatively short document, but pertinent to our mission at Wickery is the reference to the medicine chest. And this is spoken about in many, uh, spoken about um, in circles of scholarship, uh, Indigenous scholarship, and it, it was thought that it was implied in other treaties, um, but the medicine chest clause has been interpreted to mean that we, as the government of Canada, we're representatives because we're paid through it, are to provide access to Western medicines, not to replace, but to complement um, and to work with traditional ways of knowing to increase the health of Indigenous people. And I think this is very pertinent to Wickery because that's our goal really is to, to complement and to co-support um, traditional ways of knowing. And with that, I will send it back to Sandy. Great, thanks, Todd. Um, I appreciate the, the personal touch on the land acknowledgement as it relates to Wickery. Um, so for today, just to kind of give an outline of what we're doing, um, I'm going to do the first part where I um, provide brief overview of Wickery year in review. Um, then I'm going to hand it over to Tanya for impact assessment that was done on our institute um, over a five-year span. Then the training advisory committee chair, Alexa, will be presenting to you. Then we'll let you know what we've been doing in the EDI space with Bethan, and each of them will, will um, introduce themselves at the time that they do their sections. Then I'm going to hand it back to Todd for strategic directions, and then we'll have discussion and correct um, and questions at the end. So um, please hold your questions. We'll just do them at the end because it is a team that's presenting um, to you today. So I'd like to just start with um, our vision and mission, just to remind people. And, and I really, the mission of Wickery really speaks to me. It's to foster the brightest minds to discover, innovate, and ultimately transform the health of children and women through supporting research excellence. So I really feel that that mission speaks to what, why Wickery exists as an institute. And as we say that, what is it that the institute, uh, you can go to the next slide, um, Nicole. 
How do we can add, add value? Well, we support over 430 U of A based researchers and, and we sit there and said, well, what can an institute do? Well, we facilitate, advocate, communicate, train, translate and sustain. It's our principles, it's our facts. We do this under three major themes, which is children's health and well-being, lifelong women's health and pregnancy and developmental trajectories. The next slide is our strategic roadmap. It is on our website. Please go to our website. It's an actually easy to navigate website. Um, but we have uh, five goals that um, reflect our, our members, our trainees, our environment, our ecosystem, and our capacity to have sustainability. So I feel like, the again, the goals are very um, uh, visionary, but also very practical as relates to what a research institute can do in women's and children's health research support. So now for the highlights, I'd like to uh, start with saying that although we WICRI staff and many of us have been mostly working remotely, that we're still here. And I think that's really important to, to note how much um, our team was able to really still support you. And we know that the last two years have been uh, incredibly trying. Um, a lot of times they haven't been able to do our research. The labs and research units have closed and opened and slowed down or not accessible due to COVID. And, and then of course we have our changing university environment. Um, but our team is still here to support you. And I just wanna uh, remind people here are the faces to the different categories of work that we do. Um, we have research platforms that continue to be there to support you in the areas of biostatistics, REDCap, data management, clinical coordination, um, qualitative design, KT planning. So um, please note these names, but again, they're all on the website as well. Um, they're here to support you. Um, we've expanded our research uh, um, in women's health at the Lowell Hill Hospital uh, Research Unit with uh, Laura um, Reese uh, joining us about a year, um, about four months ago. So, so we've been able to expand some of our support and we continue to, to provide over $2 million in competitor grant funding annually. And I'll talk to that a bit when I get to um, our overview of our financial state of WICRI. And then you might have noticed, I hope that our community, no, I'm still on this slide, Nicole, I'm just a little bit people, um, the, uh, the, that the communications team has been very powerful. We've been trying to communicate the stories, the research, the great work that's been done. We had a 15 year celebration last year, which was great um, and was able to do that. So if you ever have any questions, please reach out to the individual categories of support that we have here. Um, and we put in Luann and Tanya as anything else that might be there that you might have questions for, please contact us anytime. So the, um, the, the next thing is really acknowledging how we exist, how we're able to be here is because of the support of our foundations, the Stollery Children's Hospital Foundations and the Alberta Women's Health Foundations. They're critical in sustaining our institute. They're wonderful partners. We work with them closely um, and recognizing their support is really important. So for our members and our trainees that have support from WICRI or WICRI members, um, please help us acknowledge them, say thank you to them, maybe go out to the fundraisers. Here are some of the examples that you can see there. Um, and because they're also messaging the importance of women's and children's health research in order to improve um, life and well being of women and children. So I think that, again, they're part of our partnership of, of not just the financial side, but messaging about the importance of research in, in, our, um, in our populations that we're, we're, we're here for. So, um, again, a big thank you to the two foundations. And I see um, Todd put something in the chat about the communications team. And I think that's, um, that's great, Todd, to, to continue adding um, to that. So please look at the chat, everyone, as well. So from a funding perspective, um, most of our funding does come from the Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation and, and the Alberta Women's Health Foundation, which is a sub-brand of the uh, Royal Alex Hospital Foundation. So if you get confused by that, they, um, we, we acknowledge Alberta Women's Health Foundation. Um, and then we do get some support from the um, Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, which has been um, really important as well for us. And this is for the main categories of research grants, research catalysts that includes 
um, supporting recruitments. I'll talk to you about some of the re new recruitments recently. Uh, partnerships, matching money when you need matching money for CIHR um, and aspects to that. So that's what the catalyst area is. And then our research platforms were, um, you saw that headed by the people in the previous slide of the team there. So there's really three main categories of research and details of uh, this funding are available in our annual report that's um, online there and you can see that. And then I just wanna acknowledge that during COVID it's been hard for everybody, including our partners, but they continue to raise money and they continue to support us during these times. And I just really, again, really uh, thank the foundations for that. We might have adjusted the timing of payments in order to adjust to the, um, the, the changes in cash flow at the beginning of COVID, but they're here for us and we continue to be able to do our research with their support. And then the next slide is our new recruits. So I just wanna um, put some faces and names to, for our membership because you're not probably seeing them always in the hallway because we're not there yet. But uh, so we have um, just an example of the recruits we've done um, in women and children's health. You can see their names in their, um, in their departments here. But we also have had over 80 assistant professors from across campus become members of WICRI over the last five years. So it's incredible when you see all these membership applications and like, wow, this is great. So again, we're, we're building capacity in women's and children's health from within, as well as from recruitments externally, um, even during these times. So that's been um, exciting for us. And then, so that's a, a quick year in review. A lot of it's on the website. A lot of it's um, accessible to you. And please do um, um, peruse that website to see what's there. And I'm gonna hand it now over to Tanya to uh, talk about the uh, um, impact assessment that was conducted on, on WICRI. So over to you, Great. Tanya. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sandy. Um, so I'm Tanya Voth and I'm the program director at WICRI. And one of the things that falls in my uh, portfolio is uh, impact assessment. So this has been a major activity for us over the last few years. Um, it's something that we do as part of our accountability to our funders and stakeholders, and we are expected to conduct a formal strategic evaluation every five years. So our approach has been to use uh, a research impact assessment framework, which was initially developed by the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and organizes investments in health research into five broad categories of impact, which you can see here on the slide. Um, and so there's some different ways that one can measure impact in each category. Uh, for advancing knowledge, we'll often look at things like bibliometrics, so numbers of publications, uh, citation analyses, proportion of projects that are reporting new health knowledge. For building research capacity, we might measure the quantity and quality of research that's supported, uh, number of trainees and staff supported by research, amount of funds that are leveraged through external granting agencies, or things like leadership achievements like um, Canada Research Chairs. As we move into uh, informing decision making, here we're looking at things like the proportion of projects that report application findings in the health system, in community, with patients, families, and other stakeholders. For health impacts, um, here we might be looking for measures that help us know if the research is leading to new treatments, improving quality of care, leading to changes in health status. And for socioeconomic impacts, we might look at things like patents, spin-off companies, social enterprises, or even the economic benefit of employing, of employing people in research. So a big challenge uh, for us is to think about these categories in the context of WICRI. So what can we reasonably expect in terms of impacts? What can we measure? What data do we have, et cetera? So our approach has been to, uh, to look at both WICRI member achievements as well as the outputs that emerge through our programs, so our grants and platforms. And we've tried to take a pragmatic approach. Um, so we've been working on this iteratively for the last several years. Uh, we've hired graduate students over the summer to complete small projects and help us develop um, evaluation planning materials. As staff, several of us have participated in evaluation and impact assessment courses to improve our skills and refine our approach. Um, and we've been adjusting our operational data collection tools to better reflect these assessment categories. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through the full five-year strategic evaluation report that we produced last year, but I am gonna highlight a few impacts that emerged in some of these different categories. And certainly if you have any interest in this topic, wanna to see the full report, um, you know, please just send me an email and I will uh, send you a link. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> 
Um, so one of the sub projects within our strategic evaluation was to work with the U of A library and conduct a bibliometric assessment for all WICRI academic members. Um, they use a tool called Insights for their analysis, and it's based on publications that are indexed in Web of Science core collection. And as you can see from this figure, uh, WICRI affiliated researchers are incredibly productive, and you represent a quarter of overall publishing output at the U of A. Next slide. And then our colleagues at the Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute at the University of Calgary uh, completed a similar type of analysis recently, and they used a different tool called SciVal. Um, and their analysis looked at the proportion of maternal child health research across several different institutes, again, compared to their host universities. Um, so here again, we see that WICRI affiliated research is approximately 25% of the total publication output at U of A. And then if we compare that with a different institute, such as SickKids, which is the green line, uh, they represent about 13% of total publication output at the University of Toronto. Uh, next slide. Then turning to trainee outputs, um, here are the main indicators that we had available to us were really just around the number of trainees supported over the last five-ish years through WICRI studentship programs. Um, but one of the aspirational goals that we have for our evaluation going forward is to really better understand um, trainee career trajectories, such as proportion of students who stay in research, and specifically in, in the women and children's health field. Um, so that's something that we'll be working on in the future. Uh, next slide. Um, during this strategic evaluation, we also took a closer look at our research platforms. So um, biostatistics, data management, clinical research coordination, qualitative design, KT support, and tried to measure both the quantity and quality of the support. So here we're showing a table that summarizes survey results um, that asked about the quality of research platform support in terms of helping you conduct research efficiently, um, help achieve methodological rigor, and apply best practices and standards. Um, there were also a number of comments in the open-ended sections of the survey that spoke to both personal and professional qualities of WICRI staff, so their generosity in sharing their expertise, showing kindness, uh, taking extra time to support a team and or work through complex scenarios and proposing innovative solutions. So again, as we go forward um, in thinking about evaluation, we're going to take a more qualitative approach and dig a bit deeper into the impact of these teams in supporting your research. Uh, next slide. And then finally, um, we've also tried to think beyond traditional academic outputs, such as publications and leveraged funding. Uh, we're seeing an increasing proportion of research supported through WICRI grants that report that they're engaging with stakeholders, that their research is producing KT strategies beyond academic publication, and that their research uh, has measurable impacts. So again, here, as we move forward, we are planning to take a more qualitative approach to better understand uh, the breadth of these research impacts that are being produced. Uh, next slide. And with that, I will now pass the mic to Alexa Thompson, who is the chair of the WICRI Trainee Advisory Committee. Wonderful. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, Katie, you can go to the next slide. So as Tanya said, my name is uh, Alexa Thompson, and I am a third-year PhD candidate in the Department of Laboratory Medicine Pathology here at the U of A. Um, I am the current chair of the Wickery Training Advisory Committee, and, and today I'll just be giving a brief overview of who we are, what we do, and some of the things that we've been working on over the, the past couple of years. Um, but first, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge all of our committee members, um, because when they say it really takes a village, they really mean it, and every single committee member on the Training Advisory Committee plays an integral part in our productivity. Uh, next slide. Um, so we're the Training Advisory Committee, but we're also abbreviated as the TAC or the Wickery Tech. Um, and our committee is composed of students and fellows from all academic levels. So we have uh, Wickery trainees that are undergraduate students all the way to master's students, PhD students, and all the way up to postdoctoral fellows um, with our undergraduate students also including the undergraduate medical education students. And all of our Wickery trainees are representative of the three Wickery research disciplines and pillars. So we have uh, Wickery trainees who focus on children's health and well-being, lifelong women's health, as well as pregnancy and development trajectories. And we also have Wickery trainees that research um, uh, topics going from basic science to clinical science, all the way to some people who are working on knowledge translation projects. Uh, next slide. 
So really we have three main objectives within the Wikri framework. Um, the first one is to provide feedback and suggestions and, and also to lead some new initiatives that try and improve Wikri program and uh, training engagement. We also provide input on career and skill building opportunities for in-training members um, through our framework and also through some of our programming. And lastly, we uh, also work to advise on and participate in the Wikery Research Day workshops. And we also are involved in the discussions on the annual Wikery Research Day topics and formats. Uh, next slide. So um, we really worked very hard over the past couple of years to expand our programming uh, for trainees and for training engagement within Recree. Um, and, and the main program that we started out with was our Recree Mentorship Program, which aims to pair Recree academic members as mentors with uh, Recree graduate students as mentees. So our Recree academic members uh, include postdoctoral fellows, uh, early career researchers, um, all the way up to full-on professors. Um, and we pair these with mentees in our program who are Wikri funded students uh, through the Wikri Graduate Studentship Program. So our Wikri Mentorship Program has been going on for uh, almost two years now, and it, it's uh, become a pretty permanent programming within the Trainee Advisory Committee. Um, and over the last year, we've also implemented a new program called the Trainee Spotlight Program, which aims to showcase the Wikri students' research accomplishments. Uh, specifically, we go back and we look at some of the Wikri funded summer students and we look at where they are now and we follow them on their path and see how the Wikri funding has helped them get to where they are right now in their career and how um, the support from Wikri has, has helped them get to that point. Um, and the last one is a new uh, studentship workshop series that we're actually kicking off this summer. Um, and this is going to be for uh, Wikri summer students or undergraduate students who applied for the Wikri summer studentship program, um, but will be available to all students regardless of outcome. And this really aims to focus on professional development skill workshops for them, including things such as having career panels, um, knowing how to use knowledge um, and technology to advance one's professional objectives, as well as focusing focusing on some soft skills such as networking and presentation skills. So as you can see, we have a, we have a broad range of programming that uh, targets both graduate students as well as undergraduate students um, and incorporates postdoctoral fellows, uh, particularly in our mentorship program. Uh, and we also have a hybrid uh, of some of the two, especially with our, our trainee spotlight program. So this is just a very brief overview of everything we've been up to. Um, but uh, year by year, we keep expanding, and, and I have no doubt that uh, over the next couple of years, you'll probably see more programming and more ideas come out of the, the Trainee Advisory Committee. Um, so if you have any questions, you can always reach us at wikritc at uilberta.ca, and our email will also be shared on the last slide of this presentation. And now I'm just going to pass it off to uh, Beth Ann, who I believe is going to talk about EDI. Yes, thanks, Alexa. Um, hi everyone, I'm Bethan Kingsley um, and I just started at Wikri in September, um, as Tanya said earlier, um, around the qualitative, or as Sandy said earlier, around the qualitative knowledge translation, uh, community-based, patient-engaged research kind of area, um, and also working in the area of equity, diversity and inclusion, so taking the lead in that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to run through um, some slides kind of to show you what we've been doing in this space. Um, can I get the next slide? So we took the U of A strategic plan and kind of used this as a foundation. Um, so we're looking at three core areas, uh, vision and leadership, research, and then looking at workforce and kind of organizational climate. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of what we're doing in those spaces. So the first one, vision and leadership, we're looking for a high level, consistent and reliably strong commitment to EDI. So things like looking at our strategy and values, uh, how are we communicating about the work that we do, um, and then looking for diversity and in governance. And next slide. Uh, so we decided not to have an externally facing um, EDI strategy and instead we've kind of created our own internal um, document working document that we're using um, and building kind of over time. And then when it comes to specific areas, then we create kind of a proposal or plan. So you can see on the left, there's one that I created around learning opportunities um, and really kind of thinking about why is it that we're doing this work um, and not just giving lip service to it, but really trying to, you know, produce some tangible kind of actions in this area. 
And then on the right, you know, thinking about communications, how are we communicating who we are? Um, what is some of the language that we're using? And can it be more inclusive, um, not just kind of in what we say, but also in what we do? So obviously the term women, uh, you know, reinforces a gender binary and is quite limiting. So how are we thinking about that? And, and what, how can we expand it slightly? Um, next slide. So the second area is quite a big one. Um, it's uh, looking to support research that thoughtfully and rigorously incorporates or contributes e um, to EDI. And so funding and capacity building are kind of the two main areas for us in this one. Um, so in terms of funding, just getting going in this area, um, I had a conversation with NSERC a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Tri Council has an action plan, um, and then each kind of Tri Council agency has their own kind of policies in in place for. Uh, kind of putting the action plan into place. And so I'm trying to have conversations with each of them to see what they're doing around um, diversification of review uh, committees, for example. Um, collecting self identification data, things like that. And so they've been quite forthcoming about, you know, the limitations of doing that, uh, the struggles they're having. So it's, it's been really fruitful conversations and we're gonna try and kind of align with some of that in our own work. Um, and then in terms of capacity building, this is quite a big area. So I have the next slide that uh, we'll kind of walk this through. Um, as a research platform, I've started to provide support to people around incorporating EDI principles and SGBA plus into their proposals. Um, and so just getting started in that, if you have you know any questions around that, I'd be happy to kind of have a conversation with you. Um, so feel free to reach out. And then on the left of the slide, you'll see I created a, a review framework for both applicants and for reviewers uh, to try and guide the process of doing this. Um, and so it's just kind of a set of questions. Uh, you'll see kind of towards the bottom, the first one, first one is around breadth of human experience. So it asks questions like, is there sufficient consideration of diversities in you know, a range of factors such as sex, gender, race, class, disability that comprise the breadth of human experiences? Are certain diversity factors and or intersections known to affect the phenomenon of interest uh, for fundamental research are multiple sexes of the animal included in the experimental design? And if not, uh, is you know, sufficient rationale given? And then for each kind of set of questions, there's a watch out for that summarizes the area. And in this case, it's watch out for an assumed homogeneity across patients, participants or samples. Um, so there's just kind of one example of some of the work we're doing. And then on the right hand side, it's really about kind of educational opportunities. Um, and so, you know, Wickery Research Day is a really big kind of opportunity for incorporating and showcasing particular research uh, happening in the, you know, that supports kind of principles of EDI. Uh, we're also partnering with a lot of people. So internally, we're part partnering uh, with the intersections of gender signature area and just about to offer a workshop series around intersectionality and health. Um, we're also working with the Office of the Vice Vice Provost uh, Florence Glanfield from Indigenous Programming and Research um, in partnership also with AHS to try and build some Indigenous anti-racism curriculum. Um, and then we just recently had conversations with the Indigenous Primary Healthcare and Policy Research Network in Alberta um, and trying to connect with AIM High to look at, you know, what other kind of opportunities can we provide? Can we provide uh, some funding uh, for students, Indigenous students who are working in the area of women and children's health at the U of A? So yeah, just some examples of some of the stuff we're doing. Uh, next slide. And then the final area is around kind of workforce and organizational climate. So a couple of things that we're aiming for in this space. Uh, we want EDI to be reflected in the recruitment, retention and advancement of staff. And we want to create an equitable and inclusive environment and culture for all staff um, and WICRI members. Um, so looking in the areas of staff learning um, and then hiring practices currently. So next slide. 
So in terms of staff learning, this is a big area that we wanted to start with uh, to create kind of a foundation of knowledge for all staff um, so that we can, again, try and support kind of this, this process externally as well. Um, and so we've developed a range of modules uh, looking at different areas. So there's Indigenous health and well-being. Uh, we're going to look at critical disability. There's queer theory and LGBTQ perspectives, um, anti-racism, a whole ton of stuff um, and so the first area that we've done is indigenous health and well-being and then there's about five modules that will come um, as part of that kind of core theme uh, so the first one is indigenous histories and teachings it gives an overview uh, of, of what kind of that module includes and then provides about five or six resources um, in that so webinars um, videos um, articles as you can see there's one on the left there that's a map that you can look at um, and then in correspondence with that, we're creating, establishing communities of practice where staff can engage with the, the materials and then speak with, you know, other people working in the area to think about, you know, how does this apply to us and the work that we do, and then providing reflection questions um, to support that process. Uh, and then in addition to that, we are having workshops that all staff members are attending. So we just had one around uh, how to create inclusive and anti-oppressive workplaces. Um, we're in the process of um, organizing one around anti-racism. Uh, yeah, and then the final slide uh, is around hiring. Um, so again, early days in this one, uh, but we are asking all hiring staff to take um, implicit bias training, and then really drawing from the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry's uh, Grow Wisely policy to look at, you know, how are we advertising positions? How do we structure the, the postings? Um, what kind of questions do we ask? Um, and really kind of thinking about what are our internal policies around this and what do we want to do? Yeah, so that's everything. Um, I'm looking for any feedback or kind of uh, advice you have in this area. So feel free to, to email me at bethan.kingsley at ulversa.ca. I'll put it in the chat as well. All right, thanks everyone. I'm passing it back to Todd. Uh, Nicole, can I go to the next slide, please? So um, I think it's important to highlight something Sandy uh, said is that we've maintained the same level of support throughout COVID across our platforms, um, which is exceptional. And I'm very thankful for the foundations for maintaining their support. When we look at other um, health charities, they've not been as fortunate. So we're very, very fortunate. Um, so we've maintained all of our platforms at the same level, plus we've been able to, um, at similar level, shall we say, institute some uh, new things. And we're just going to have a highlight of, I think, four or well, seven or eight of them. Um, and they're not necessarily big platforms, but one is the, um, we've reinstituted a grant review support program that's very or similar to one. And thank you, Michelle, who's on this call. Uh, for leading this um, to what we did about a decade ago. I mean, GAP existed and ever, as everybody knows was set and what's happening with the organization, GAP ceased to exist. And so the, fa the faculty or our FOMD anyways, um, stepped in briefly and we're um, leading a charge here to help with uh, grant review. And there's a, there's a lot of uh, details on this slide, but Essentially, it's um, we can do more than the GAP program. We've been able to reach out and get external reviewers. We've done five. It was an intake in the fall. And really, this is about getting you with a champion, somebody who in your area doesn't have to be internal, um, that can support you and give you honest, critical feedback so that you can and can do so early. So, And um, we also have um, opportunities, as Beth and locally, who has put some stuff together around EDI and and sex and gender based criteria for for CHR grants um, to help you and if, if you know as things go forward, if necessary to support grant editing, um, as well as more traditional um, aspects of your considerations for your CHR grant. So I implore anyone who is submitting in the fall, I know I'll be availing of this because I'll be submitting a new grant in the fall um, to reach out early and, and, and arrange, uh, we can help arrange to have it uh, re reviewed. And we know this, the data is absolutely overwhelmingly clear, clear here. 
that going through GAP traditionally, but previously the, our editing programs increases success rate. And that's really what we want is more people to be successful. Uh, next slide, please, Nicole. Um, so we all <laughs> also instituted, and I guess there was new money because this, this came out of new money um, from, the, from the faculty. Um, we instituted and we've had our first meeting. It's been a year and a half to get this up and running. What, I, what we're calling the translational genomics hub. So bear with me for a second. This is kind of a odd um, situation. So really the purpose of this is to bring diagnoses to cases that are likely genetic, um, that are unsolved, if you will. So, so we're currently focusing on children, but we'll, we're happy if people have unknown genetic cases for women's health. Um, so cases are brought forward to the hub, which is really a group of experts that um, consider, well, we can do two things. One is we can reanalyze whole exome data. Uh, well, actually, we, we know how to, we just need permission from uh, the administrators to do so. So we're, we're held up on that. Um, so we can reanalyze whole exome data to see if they missed something in a traditional clinical lab or if there's something that they wouldn't report because it may be a very of an unknown significance that we should look closer at. We can also take trios that have variants of unknown significance that may be causing disease and move it through this panel so that we can help provide experimental evidence that it, the variants of unknown significance is actually causing disease or not. I mean, either one is a win, right? Um, and we've actually had our first two cases and we're moving to the wet lab for one and the other one we're doing a bit more work on. But this facilitates a lot of things because if you're a clinician bringing us a case, um, we've got global ethics. We can do consent assents. We have permission to collect um, human tissue. We have storage set up for that or in the process of it. We have a research coordinator working on this and we can provide small amounts of funding for wet lab stuff to validate it. And we um, and for the storage and other things. So and, and it's all under one umbrella. So it greatly decreases the administrative burden of each one of these steps on the clinician bringing forward the case and the PIs working them up. So that's the lab. If you guys have cases or are interested, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and there's uh, we can put you where you need to go for what you're interested in. Next, please. Um, so this is, so I, I'm happy to say that uh, the Lowest Full Hospital Women's Research Center has now been open for two years. This is a massive, this is a 4,000 square foot face, space, not face, space on the first floor of uh, the lowest, uh, the lowest whole hospital for women. Um, it's currently supporting 14 principal investigators. Um, there's been over 200 visits now, and that's impressive considering this has been over the course of COVID, right, that we've been doing this. Um, and we've hired, it's almost well, a year and a half ago, Laura, who I can see her smiling face on, the, on this, uh, who is a research coordinator to help um, run this and facilitate uh, research visits in this space. And if you wish to avail yourself of this wonderful um, physical space and opportunity, please reach out to Laura um, to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and the next one, Nicole, please. So there's a lot going on in this space. So as you guys are aware, there's a nice yellow uh, map of Alberta. We don't exist in isolation in Edmonton. Um, Healthcare in Canada has become very apparent, including last night's annou announcement, that it's governed provincially. And we work within a province, and we thought it didn't make any sense to be competing, but to collaborate. And so our initial um, first steps were with um, ACRI, so the Alberta Children's Hospital um, Research Institute in Calgary, to build um, joint opportunities, if you will. So the first was to develop teams between the two places. We've had uh, one funded that's going forward. So if you are, if there's like-minded people that you know in Calgary that you want to start working with, we can fund uh, initial meetings and uh, mechanisms to build that team. So reach out for that opportunity. Um, with respect to pediatric health outcomes program. So um, this was actually driven by our HS partner, who is very interested in taking advantage, or not taking advantage, of looking 
at what's happened throughout the pandemic to healthcare independent, well, because of COVID, but not specifically COVID outcomes. We know we've gone to online. Uh, we know that there may or may not be benefit to that. And we really wanted to assess that and not just going online, but impacts of whatever's happening in our hospitals over the last couple of years. And so through collaboration with Abby Spore um, and Mincy, we've been able to support um, a few projects to look at um, these health outcome impacts uh, over the last several years. And if you have ideas, and this is Abu score is health administrative data, right? Again, it makes sense. You have to have a partner in, in uh, down south um, because it's province-wide. Min data is fundamentally province-wide. So work with, with a collaborator down there. And this last opportunity is very, very exciting. and is very um, recent. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Canada First Research Excellent Fund is a giant grant um, that each institution can only put one in um, per cycle, and the last cycle was four years ago or five years ago. Uh, they're to the tune of about $100 million over seven years, so it's not a small grant. Very large grant. I think it's the biggest public um, funding opportunity that exists in Canada. We're not leading this. We are the we are the partner with Acri on this one. Um, well, the University of Calgary because it's being led by the University of Calgary, but really Acri and Wickery are driving it. Um, and it's evolving this opportunity. And we we're in the letter of intent stage. And we would encourage uh, people as it comes forward and you hear about it to get involved and to advocate for. Um, to, to be involved and to advocate for areas of research that you think are important within the child health spectrum. And it's the grant title is the One Child, Every Child. And with that, I will um, send it or give it back to Sandy. Thank you. Great, thanks Todd. And thank you to all the speakers. Um, so I'd like to just end on this um, slide with the national partnerships that we've been very involved um, with our member organizations and leaders. Um, a new one is the Partnership of Women's Health Research Canada. We've been working on it for about two years now and the official launch is on March 2nd of this year. So very exciting as we come up to International Women's Day. And this is a partnership between four institutions across Canada, but, but obviously inclusive and engaging others. So um, we're building momentum in the area of, of women's health through this national um, organization that we're building from, from the beginning. And then I'd like to highlight my CERN, Maternal Infant Child Youth Health Network, um, who's been in existence uh, for a long time now, but has really grown. We have links with 21 maternal child health research organizations. There's a clinical trials infrastructure, um, rare diseases, national coordination. The, there's a lot going on with MyCERN right now. So again, visit their website if you're interested in understanding and, and learning more about these national networks. Power just got their website up and running. So, um, so uh, please uh, see what's going on and that there is a national voice out there advocating for women and children's health. And, and um, we are there to support that. Next slide. So I'd just like to highlight and say we wouldn't be here being able to do all this work in support of um, improving women's and children's health and, and well-being without our foundations. So the Stoller Children's Hospital Foundation has been tremendous. This has been 15 years of WICRI, um, Alberta Women's Health Foundations, the new branding of the um, Losal Hospital that then was the Royal Alex Hospital Foundation. So between these two foundations, we're able to do what we do as an institute to support you, your research, your trainees, and, um, and we're here to answer any questions. And the next slide is that. Please reach out to us, um, any feedback. We're gonna open this now up for questions and discussion. Um, we communicate hopefully well. Uh, we wanna communicate enough, but maybe not over communicate, but our weekly bulletin, our quarterly newsletter. And um, like I said, we're, we're um, here to support you and your research and we'd like to hear from you. So with that, I think we'll stop sharing the slides and, um, and pull up the full screen as we have and, um, and open it up. We can now unmute everybody, um, Nicole, and open it up for just closing my, um, for my discussions. Um, please raise your hand or 
yeah, please raise your hand. That puts you up in the upper right. If you can electronically raise your hand or put anything in the chat, um, anything you would like to, to do. Oh, no questions, <laughs> no comments. This is Zoom for you. If, if we were in real life, we would have then had snacks and everyone would have been chatting and it uh, doesn't look like that now. I just like to um, say that um, we have good news within our, our Wickery family is that uh, Brianne is going to be leaving on maternity leave. So congratulations to Brianne and, and her new family. And uh, Yolanda, who's here, maybe Yolanda can raise your hand is uh, we'll be stepping in um, for, um, she, and Yolanda's been with us as well for a long time, but we'll be there. So you might be, if you've been in touch with Brianne ever, uh, might now transfer over to Yolanda and thank you Yolanda for doing that. So just an update on personnel changes within, within our team. So Todd, anything else? Um, this really was uh, to inform people. It doesn't look like anyone really has any burning questions, so they can ask us at any time. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Todd, for any last comments or, or insight. Um, no, I'm very. I mean, I just I'm very optimistic with uh, the state of support for women and children's health and what's happening provincially, um, and that you know hopefully this is a good news story for people who may. Uh, like me, I uh, haven't had so many of those lately. So hopefully, <laughs> at least if, thanks for coming and hopefully we did, we gave you good news. But please reach out if you have any questions. Great. On that note, I think that's good. Give everybody back their 15 minutes. That's our gift to you today. How's that? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks everyone for coming out. And, um, and as always, reach out to us. Thanks. And thank you to all the speakers today.